Hey, Jim Zass, welcome back to you again with another exciting training video to help you renovate and flip houses for massive profits. On this training video, I'm not going to show you what to do, I'm going to show you what to not do. And this is a lesson I've learned the hard way. So in the past 12 months, my wife and I have uh, bought and have sold or in the process of rehabbing and selling about 40, 50 houses. Okay, so we've done a lot in the past just 12, 16 months. And uh, we have we did a little bit of research recently on the houses we've done. And uh, by and large, our houses sell at or above asking price. And our asking price is top of the market, right? And um, they sell very quickly with the exception of about five houses. And so we just were frustrated. It's like, man, this is so frustrating. So what we did is we made a list of these five houses that didn't sell very well. They didn't sell quickly, didn't sell at the high price, whatever. And we asked ourselves, what does this have in common? My wife is actually the one who discovered it. Her name's Marina. Most of you know her. And she said, you know what? It's the no basement. So anyway, on this, on this, on this video, I'm going to talk about a, a broader topic. Uh, types of houses you do not want to buy. Okay, these are all lessons I've learned from personal experience. Some are common sense. Some of times you might say, Jim, I could have told you that. Why did it, why did it take you uh, doing a bad deal to learn that? Well, you know, I'm a little slow, I guess, but that's okay. I still 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 flip 40 houses a year, so it's okay. Where did my pen go? I guess my pen's right here. This will work. So let's go. First one, I already mentioned it. Let's talk about um, houses not to buy. All right, I'm just gonna put this up. Here as a disclaimer, not to buy. All right. So if there is no basement, don't buy the house. Now there's an exception to that. There's an exception to most rules. Did you notice that? So when uh, when the house does not have a basement, um, the exception would be like a split level house. You say you got a 2,500 square foot temporary split level where it has a lower level but not like a basement basement that's okay that's totally fine uh, but if we're talking about a ranch or a Cape Cod or a colonial or something like that you gotta have a basement without a basement you ain't gonna, it's gonna have a hard time selling right Cause why because people need the storage if it's a small house they need another family room down there they need to finish so if there's no basement make your life easy don't even go look at the house okay so my assistant actually uh, caught that recently sent her to go look at the house she looked at it and she gives me back a spec sheet on, it, on the house and it said no base. I was like, oh crap, I missed that. All right, next one. And this might seem like a no brainer, but this is a lesson I had to learn the hard way. If the house is in a flood zone, do not buy it. Floods, flood zone, flood insurance will cost you uh, 500 to $1,000. I'm, I'm sorry, no, it's about $2,000 a year. I think is what it is. Um, 2,000 bucks a year. It's ridiculous. Um, very pricey. I think that's the right number. Anyway, my wife would know it's a lot of money. And what it does, um, especially if you're dealing with an entry-level house, a lot of time your entry-level home buyers are right there at the top of their DTI, debt to income ratio. And when you get adding on flood insurance, it screws up the numbers so then they can't qualify for the mortgage to buy the house. All right. Not to mention that, but who the heck wants to live in a flood zone, right? Um, so it's, it's not cool. So don't buy a house in a flood zone because if you're going to hold it as a rental, you don't want to fix it up. And if you're going to flip it, who wants to live in a flood zone and have a hard time flipping it? All right, next one. Um, let's talk about how functionally, I'm going to just do F U N C, obsolete. All right, functionally obsolete. What does that mean? Well, that can mean a bunch of different things. Either the house, um, let's say it's, now you've heard gurus say actually, oh, if it's a four bedroom, one bath house, it's functionally obsolete. Is it really? How hard is it to add a bathroom? If it's a four bed, one bath house, 2,000 square foot, I promise you I can add another full bath, maybe one and a half bathrooms in that house, right? Now, do you need to walk through the house to make sure it's situated such that you can? Of course, might want to move some walls, of course, but it's, it's, it's easy. We add bathrooms all the time. Um, we added one and a half bathrooms in the house we just did, right? We created 800 more square feet of living space, adding two bedrooms and a bathroom, and then a half bath in the basement, and we finished a room in the basement. It was amazing what you can do with the right vision. So when you walk through a house, don't look at what it is. I mean, you do need to look what it is, but don't just look at what it is. Look what it can be. All right. So, um, but yes, if it's a four bed, one bath, two thousand square foot house, it's got to get something's got to change. There's got to be another uh, bathroom in there somewhere. Um, what if you've got to walk through a bedroom to get to the only bathroom? Functionally obsolete. 
If you've got, unless you can maybe open up a wall, build a hallway, reorient the bathroom, then you can fix it, right? What if you've got to, if it's a three bedroom house and you've got to walk through bedroom number two to get to bedroom number three? What does that mean? It means bedroom number two isn't technically a bedroom because you have to walk through it. So, but again, could you build a hallway and make it two separate bedrooms? Potentially, you could. Um, what if the house is just weird? The flow sucks and you can't fix it. Now I tell you, we have bought some houses with terrible flow. We just did a house in Jenkintown right now. Um, if you're starting out, don't think about moving walls and all. It's not worth it. You gotta wait till you get in the habit. You know what sells. You can have the sixth sense of what buyers like, right? But we just did this house in Jenkintown. Uh, we bought it for three hundred and ten thousand dollars, and we're putting almost two hundred thousand dollars worth into it, right? A lot of money. It'll sell for a lot, but it's cool. So anyway, the flow sucked. There was this. Uh, it was an older house. There's this. Um, uh, make servants stairway back down to the kitchen. Of course, the kitchen was isolated, narrow doors with open all sorts of stuff up. Got rid of that extra stairway, added a master bathroom, all sorts of crazy stuff. But for today's market, that house was functionally obsolete because of the layout, the flow. So we had to fix the flow. A lot of times you can't fix it. But again, if you're starting out, don't do that. All right. So functionally obsolete, I think that speaks for itself. Um, if it's just really weird, um, I'm going to talk about two more. Location, and then two, big or small. All right, so location, let's talk about location. Um, is it on a super busy road? Should you buy it? Probably not. I tell you, I've made a lot of money selling houses on busy roads. Because in a hot market, which is like where I live right now, if the inventory is really low, the only houses that get left ones on busy roads. But if the inventory is really low for the end buyer, the end user, then you come in and let's say it's a really desirable school district or neighborhood or town, okay, which it must be if you're buying a busy road, and then you come in, offer a better product than anybody else, even if they're back a couple streets off the busy road, your house will still sell. But again, if you're getting started, don't do a busy road. Um, is it next to a trash dump, right? Is it right across the street from the prison or something like that? Keep in mind with the surroundings. So you heard me say in a previous video, uh, what you want to say is, um, I don't even want to say, what you want to do is stand in the front yard and look around, okay? And before you go out to the house, you can go to googlemaps.com and uh, check out the location as well. Is the house too big or too small? You think of Jim, too big? Really? Yeah. I looked at a house last week um, and the house was 4,800 square feet. You might have seen a picture of it I posted on Facebook. Anyway, huge house. It needed $200,000 of work and just a couple of blocks from the other one I'm doing that I mentioned a minute ago in this video. Well, this house was 4,800 square feet. The other one was 3,500 square feet, right? This house needed a ton of work. Beautiful home, full of character, great bones. It was, it was an awesome house, but needed a lot of work. Uh, I would have absolutely taken on the project if it weren't for two things. One, it was too big for the area, right? It was on too busy of a road. It was really, really close to it. Now, if it were a 5,000 square foot home back on an estate and like on like you know, five acres or something like that in the right town, like where, near where I live, Absolutely, I'd do that deal, right? It was on a busy road, on a small lot, surrounded by neighbors, not a good deal. It's too big a house, too big a house. So that's an example of too big. You don't see that too often. Or what if the house is too small? Do you see that? Of course you do. Now here's a trick, here's a little tip. If you're out, if you're looking at how it deals on the MLS or something like that, you come across one that's 800 square feet or 900 square feet, and you look through the pictures like, man, I think that's bigger. It's happened a few times where we've gotten deals because it said 800 and something square feet on the MLS. I went and looked at it because it looked bigger than that square footage. And sure enough, there was an addition or two that was put on that was actually good, but it uh, wasn't reflected in the square footage. And so a lot of other rehabbers weren't going to look at the house because it was too small, but in reality, it was big enough. A couple hundred, a few hundred square feet can go a long way. If the house is too small, should you add on to it? Probably not. I mean, additions are a pain in the butt. I've never done one. I'd rather just fix what's there already, but you can build up, you can build out, uh, but that's going to, I tell you what, if you get into additions and do it, the bigger renovation costs you get, the bigger cash on cash return you need for your for your investment, okay? So if you're used to making, say, 12, 14%, so if, you're, if you lay out a total of 200 grand, you want to be making 30 grand net, net, net at the end of the day off that deal. But if you're going to be laying out 600 grand and it's going to take you eight months, I mean, you could be making 20% at least, okay? 
So hope that makes sense. If it's too big or too small, don't buy it. If the location is not right, don't buy it. If it's functional obsolete, don't buy it. No basement, don't buy it. Or if it's a flood zone, don't buy it. All right, I'm gonna be doing a 90 minute training, so about 75 minute training webinar, uh, live webinar, where I'm gonna take some Q&A and uh, do a bunch of uh, cool stuff on there. You're gonna like so you. I'll talk to you soon.